Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our virtual counterculture with Murcia Alvino Cheese, PDO Cheese. We're very excited this afternoon. I am personally very excited because this is one of my favorite cheeses in the world. My name is Susan Axelrod, and I'm the editor in chief at Culture, and I am thrilled to be bringing you this presentation this afternoon um, on behalf of my colleagues at Culture. We have an, a great program for you. First, we're going to hear from Mercedes Lamami, uh, who's going to introduce um, Eduardo, who is from the Consorcio of Mercy Alvino in Spain. Then we're going to have a tasting um, and discussion of the cheese with Emilia Dalbero, who's from the Green Grape in Brooklyn, New York. We've got a lot to get to, but before we get started, just a few housekeeping rules. Um, please use the chat feature to ask your questions and we will try to answer them if they are pertinent to the discussion during the presentations, um, but we'll also have a dedicated Q&A time at the end, about 10 minutes. So please feel free to interact, share your pairing ideas, share your thoughts about the cheese. We want to um, have you engage as much as possible with the presenters and each other. Um, so without any further ado, I'm going to have Mercedes take it away. She is the Associate Director of Foods from Spain. Mercedes. Hello, good afternoon. On behalf of Foods from Spain and Murcia Albino Cheese, thank you for joining us today. It's great to be here with you. Spain has been producing cheese for hundreds of years. We have more than a hundred different types of cheeses, and today, we're going to learn about one of those cheeses, Murcia Albino Protected Denomination of Origin Cheese, a goat cheese made, made with goat cheese bathed in wine from the Murcia region of Western Spain. And on that note, let me introduce to you Eduardo Hava from the Denomination of Origin Council who will briefly explain their role in protecting the production and the promotion of these United Cheeses. So Eduardo, welcome. Hi everybody and welcome to this tasting for this amazing cheese we had in Spain and also in USA. Um, probably you know this cheese years ago but um, I'm going to, well, firstly, to introduce myself. Uh, I'm veterinary. I'm working for the um, regulatory council for the latest um, 50, 17 years. And I do uh, my work in the tasting panel and the controls in the, in the breeders and the cheese makers. And um, that's in that's my my work story for my English is a little poor but I try it um, firstly I want to, to explain uh, the concept of the PDO because it's an European concept and it has a, a meaning um, for those um, um, feed stuffs that uh, has the the seal of the PDO on the label um, firstly, um, protected. What does it mean protected? Because uh, these products are protected by EU regulations. Um, we have rules in Europe that protect uh, these products against imitations or misuses um, possible. Um, in fact, in USA, we have uh, problems with uh, some cheeses that uh, imitate uh, our uh, Murcia Albino Cheese PDO, and um, the consumers uh, had to know how to, to recognize uh, the true, the authentic uh, Murcia Albino PDO cheese. The second letter of the PDO is the D for designation, and it means that um, the PDO name is protected in that name in English is Murcia Albino Cheese PDO in Spanish, queso de Murcia albino de OP. That name is compulsory that um, be on the label of the, the cheese if the, if the cheese is um, authentic. And the third letter is origin. 
Origin means that the product is made and in a certain region, in that case is all the Murcia region, is a region in the southwest of Spain near the coast, the Mediterranean coast. It's a um, warm region, the climate is warm and in the summer really boiling and arid, but we have um, a local breed of goats that are well adapted to these conditions. So in, to resume, um, PDO uh, is different uh, of a brand. Uh, you can find different brands of Murcia albino cheese PDO, but all of them have to show the seal of the PDO on this, on this uh, level. Um, so uh, I want to remark uh, the importance um, that the P European PDO logo that circle in yellow and red color has to be sure that um, you are um, in front of a real PDO cheese. And all the PDOs in Europe uh, have um, um, register document with the rules for the product um, related with the origin, as I said, uh, but also with the ingredients that we can use for the, these products. In that case, only Murcia goat breed milk can be used for to, do, uh, to produce these cheeses. Um, furthermore, the, the wine we use is also a PDO wine from Murcia is a um, monasterial grape wine, a red wine, a local red wine that we use to, to soak the cheeses and give the wine that flavor you can appreciate um, after with, uh, when the, the tasting starts. Um, a regulatory council um, do um, two main tasks. Um, firstly, um, we do a promote, a promote um, work as um, tastings like we are doing now, but um, the most of our work is related with the control uh, of the producers of the eight cheesemakers and the 140 um, goat breeders that produce the, the cheeses. So um, we do, um, for example, um, inspects farms in the local goat breeders to assure the, the breed is Murciana goat and the feeding of the breeds, the forks, um, with the local grazing and local byproducts, and also the the, the work of milking in the farm and the, how uh, the farmer preserve the, the milk. And we take uh, samples of the milk in the farms and to analyze and see if the, the milk is um, has the quality enough. Um, so in the farms, we do, we do that work, but in the cheese producers, uh, we also had a um, a big um, work, a big, a big tax doing um, a work uh, to track in the, um, the traceability of the product of the cheese with the farms who produce the milk and um, seeing if the cheese maker followed the receipt, the, the cheese uh, has a, a accurate receipt that the cheese makers have to follow in order to, to have a, a good Murcia albino PDO cheese. Also, we check the, the producer self controls. Um, we can see uh, if the cheese maker analyze um, their cheeses. Um, finally, we take samples of these cheeses in the end of the aging period, and we um, bring these, cheese, these samples of cheese to the tasting panel to analyze the sensory quality. So, and that's um, our work in the regulatory council. Um, it um, assures that the cheese you have in the USA with our label, with the PDO logo, 
uh, is a product that um, complies with the rules and it, it quality is um, a good a good real wood quality as you can see in the next testing. Thank you. Now, um, Susan. Yes. Thank you, Eduardo. That was very interesting. Really appreciate learning about the cheese right from the source. Thank you so much. Um, now we're going to go on to everyone's favorite part, tasting the cheese with Emilia Dalbero from The Green Grape, who's going to talk more about the qualities of this cheese and, and lead us to the tasting, through the tasting, I should say. And again, fe please feel free to ask your questions and share your ideas and thoughts about the cheese in the chat. Emilia. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Amelia, like Susan said, thank you so much. Um, and I am so excited to be here today to talk to you about Murcia Alvino. Um, before we get started, I just did want to give you a little bit of background uh, information on myself. Um, I have been a cheesemonger in New York City for about five years now, almost exactly five years. Um, and I am also an American Cheese Society certified cheese professional. Um, last year, I did take second place in the Cheesemonger Invitational in New York, as well as I um, winning the uh, virtual Cheesemonger Invitational earlier that summer. Um, so it gave me an opportunity to really learn a lot about a lot of cheeses that I previously had not known about. Um, but Morcia Albino is one that I've known about for a very long time, and I'm very happy about that. Um, so right now I'm currently the cheese manager and buyer for the Green Grape here in Brooklyn, New York. We are an independently and women-owned woman grocery store. We do specialty foods, um, and our focus is providing our customers with high quality and artisan local products. I always say that we're small but mighty because it is New York, so it's a very small space, um, but we pack a lot in there. My cheese counter uh, currently houses about 250 different cheese and charcuterie items from all over the world. Um, and my job as the buyer is to research and source the best of those. And I'm also responsible for training my staff on how to properly care for and sell all of these products to our customers. So I am first and foremost a cheesemonger, but I also like to consider myself a cheese educator. And I love working with both industry professionals and consumers. Um, to boost their cheese knowledge and appreciation. So today we're gonna to be talking about one of our favorite cheeses, Murcia Alvino here. Um, and Eduardo uh, apologize for his English and I'm going to apologize for my Spanish. <laughs> um, I will do my best, but we're gonna talk about the cheese and we're gonna talk about how to cut and sell it to our customers. Um, like I said, it's one of our best selling cheeses and a lot of my customers actually ask for it by name these days, um, which is very cool. So as we go along, Feel free to ask any questions that you have in the chat box um, and we'll do our best to answer all of them at the end or um, during the presentation. Um, and I do wanna say, uh, like I said, I'm a cheesemonger, I'm not a graphic designer, so I really did my best with these slides. <laughs> um, so let's move on. So um, good, this slide is good here. So what is Morcia Alvino and how did it, uh, previous slide is fine. Thank you. Um, so how did it, come to be one of Spain's best known cheeses. The name itself roughly translates to wine cheese from the Murcia region. Um, it's a pretty direct translation. And just like some of the world's best cheeses, uh, the origin of Murcia Alvino actually comes from a cheesemaker's innocent mistake. According to local legend, once upon a time, there was this slightly forgetful cheesemaker um, who left a few wheels of cheese out on a table that was a little bit slanted on one end. And the next day he returned to his shop to find that the cheese wheels had just disappeared and he didn't know where they went. Um, so he's confused, but he doesn't really think much of it and he continues to make his cheese. Some time passes and he decides to empty a wine barrel that was conveniently located at the end of his slanted table. Um, and when he empties it, he finds that the missing wheels of cheese were at the bottom of the barrel. They had rolled off the table and right into the wine barrel where they stayed and soaked up that wine until that they were discovered. They tried the cheese and everyone who tasted the cheese agreed that it was delicious, obviously, and uh, Morcia Alvino allegedly was born. So today, um, there are only eight producers of Morcia Alvino who handcraft this cheese using locally sourced milk from 150 herds of Morciana goats in the Morcia region of Spain. 
Two of those producers are actually farmstead producers, meaning the cheese is made from the milk of their own herd of goats. And while this cheese is sold under different brand names in the United States, they are all categorized as Morcia Alvino PDO, and the cheese was granted PDO status in 2001. The queso de Morcia label, as well as the PDO seal, are visible on the packaging of the cheese that you received, um, and you can also see it on the slide here. So right at the bottom, you have the PDO logo and then the specific Queso de Morcia logo. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with the concept of PDO, it's a European designation, meaning protected designation of origin, um, as Eduardo was talking about. And it signifies that the production and promotion of this cheese is highly regulated by a group called a consortium. Regulating the production of this cheese guarantees quality and authenticity, and putting that PDO seal on the final product um, helps consumers recognize that the cheese that they're buying is legitimate, it's the real deal. So producers who don't adhere to the rules and standards set by the regulatory council and who are not certified with the consortium are not actually legally allowed to call their cheese Morcia Alvino. All right, so Morcia Alvino um, has been made for years in Spain's Morcia region, right on the Mediterranean coast. And this is a very arid region that has many different landscapes within its subtropical climate. So the rainfall is scarce, the weather is really hot and dry. Um, and like I said, this cheese is made exclusively with the milk of Morciana goats. And these goats are known not only for having high milk yield, but their milk is also really famously high in uh, fat and protein, which makes it perfect for making high quality, delicious cheeses like the Murcia Albino. And so the goats graze freely on these native grasses and flowers and herbs. And then the shepherd, shepherds actually supplement their diet with olive branches, grains, legumes, barley, and corn. And all of that together helps to produce this very rich, um, sweet flavored milk. The goats are milked once daily, and it generally takes um, about 18 liters, which is almost five gallons of milk to produce one wheel of Morcia Alvino. So they're working hard. Um, so milk production is also seasonal, as you may or may not know. Um, so it fluctuates and the goats do produce less milk in the spring and summertime. You can go to the next slide, please. Amelia, we have yes. a question. Yes. Um, uh, Lisa says, this is my first time having Murcia Alvino. It is probably the creamiest aged goat cheese I've ever had. Fatty, delicious, and balanced. What is the post make of this cheese? Is it waxed and then dipped in wine? Is wine, is no. the rind treated in any other way? So the rind is, um, as far as I know, actually just a completely natural rind that they actually make the cheese um, and then let the rind dry out for a few weeks before they kind of soak it in that, in that wine to give it that color. And we are actually gonna get into that in the next portion of the presentation, but that's a great question. We also have a hooray for CCPs. <laughs> hooray for them, <laughs> and us, I guess. <laughs> um, so in, let's, let's talk about how we make Morcia Alvino. After the goats are milked, um, the milk for this cheese is pasteurized and then they coagulate it with traditional animal rennet. Um, and for those who don't know, rennet is the enzyme traditionally taken from the stomach of an animal and then used to coagulate milk to separate it into solid curds and liquids like whey. Um, for Murcia Alvino, once the curds are formed in the vat, they then cut them into two to three inch grains. They then wash the curds, which is the process of releasing a portion of the whey from the vat and replacing it with water. And what that does is slows acid production down um, and therefore creates a sweeter flavor profile in the final product. Um, this is something that you may recognize if you've ever read about Gouda production, um, but it's actually a pretty commonplace practice in cheese making. And so the smaller producers will actually do all of this by hand. Um, and then at the larger producers, it sometimes is done by machine, but always under the watchful eye of a cheese master who is there specifically to make sure that the PDO regulations are being followed to make sure that this cheese is made um, with the highest standards and the highest quality. So after you form these curds, they're then packed into molds um, for the wheels and then pressed for two to four hours in order to obtain that really smooth, dense, creamy texture um, that we are all enjoying and that someone mentioned before. And pressing um, actually helps to expel any excess whey until the cheese reaches the desired consistency. The formed cheeses are then immersed in a saltwater solution or brine for up to 20 hours. And this is called wet salting or brining. 
Salt is a really important part of cheese making because not only does it affect the flavor of the cheese, but it does a lot of other things. Like it helps regulate microbial growth. It affects the pH levels of the cheese. It aids in rind formation and then also helps determine the cheese's final texture. That is some cheese science that is absolutely crazy and we could teach an entire class just on that. So I'm not gonna get any further into it. Um, but after salting, the final cheese is actually aged for a minimum of 45 days. And then after the fifth week, when the rind has dried out a little bit, the wheels are soaked in the wine made from local Monastrell grapes. And the wine is called Doble Pasta, um, which is named for the double fermentation process. That makes it an incredibly full flavored wine. It really lends this fruity, floral, slightly tannic note to this cheese, and it provides it with that really striking violet rind. So, Obviously, after hearing all of that, we know that making cheese is a really, really labor intensive, physically difficult and intense process. And sometimes consumers and even like newer mongers don't consider all of the hard work that goes into making a single wheel of cheese. And so that's why I'm always trying to tell my mongers to show respect to all of the cheeses. We were keeping it in good condition. We're cutting and wrapping it the correct way. And this way you're also showing respect to everyone who's involved in the process of creating that product and getting it to the customer. Everyone from the goats to the farmers, to the cheese makers, to importers and distributors. So that's a very important thing that I would like to um, highlight. All right, so um, now that you've got some background information on the cheese, let's do the fun part. Let's do the tasting. Um, you can go to the next slide, please. Awesome, so you should have received a piece of Morcia Albino in the mail. I know some of you didn't, um, but if you did, it was courtesy of the Morcia Albino designation in collaboration with Culture Magazine and Foods from Spain. So thank you so much to them for providing this cheese for us today. Um, and I do always recommend bringing your cheese to room temperature before tasting or serving. Um, so 30 to 45 minutes in advance is, should do the trick and it helps you experience the full depth of flavor of this cheese and all of those nuances. So, um, so we're gonna actually look at it before we taste it. Um, just, you know, give it a, a little look over, um, just look at that, the difference between the, the bone white paste and that really, really striking rind. Um, it's a very visually pleasing cheese, like right off the bat, this is gonna catch a customer's eye in the case. All right, so now we're gonna talk about texture. Um, I'm going to have you guys cut a small piece from the wedge. Make sure you get a little bit of rind on that piece. It's really important. Um, and then just kind of like press it between your fingers and see like it bounces back a little. It's pretty soft and creamy. If this is a semi-soft pressed cheese, as I mentioned before, it's fairly elastic. It's supple. And as I mentioned, um, pressing the cheese during cheese making does create like a smoother, denser, more homogenous paste in the final product getting closer to the fun part. So now you're gonna sniff it, a little sniff. Um, and the main aroma here is the characteristic wine that it is soaked in. It's floral, it's inviting. It's not harsh on the nose though. It's not alcoholic, it doesn't burn. It's a very, very pleasant smell. And the fun part now, you're gonna take a bite of that cheese and then you're just gonna slowly chew and savor that bite to really get the full effect. And you wanna make sure that this cheese touches every part of your palate. And the best way to do that is to just press the cheese to the roof of your mouth for a, full, for a few seconds, so. What are we, what are we thinking? What are we tasting here? Any comments? We have a question. How okay. long is the how long is the wheel uh, soaked in the wine? Oh, that's actually a really good question, and I don't know the answer to that off the top of my head. But I will make a note to look it up um, at the end of the um, at the end of the class, or maybe Eduardo knows the answer. Eduardo, are you listening? Can you share that answer if you have it? Yes. No. How long is it soaked in the wine? Yes, um, for two days, more or less. Okay. Depending on the quality of the wine, the, how many times we have used the wine to bath the, the cheeses. Um, but um, 
normally in two days the the thesis is, is ready excellent thank you thank you eduardo we do have a comment creamy cool. sweet and mild spot on um, so I, I was going to say that Morcia Albino is fairly mellow and mild. Um, it's also low in salt and it has a lot of very prominent sweet cream notes. And they're balanced by this like slight almond flavor and that light signature tanginess from the goat's milk. So a lot of people think that they don't like all goat's milk cheese just because it's too sour or barnyardy or they've had like a chev that they didn't really like. Um, but this cheese, in my experience, is definitely a game changer for goat milk eaters. Um, people taste this cheese and they love it. So there's also this very distinct, distinct grapey wine flavor that really permeates the entire cheese, but it's not overwhelming at all, um, which is very cool. Texture on the palate, slightly fudgy, slightly creamy due to that high fat content of the Marciana goat's milk, which again makes it perfect for cheese making. So. Delicious cheese. Is everyone enjoying it? We do have a couple more comments. Um, cool. the flavor is very clean. Is that attributed yeah. to the breed of goat and or the and or the process? Yeah, um, I think that it can be attributed to a few things. Definitely um, attributed to the breed of goat and also the goat's diet. Um, we, in cheese, we talk about terroir the same way that we talk about terroir in wine. So everything, um, every part of the environment of that the goats are living in affect the flavor of that milk. Everything from um, what kind of herbs and flowers they're eating to what season it is um, to like how stressed out they are. Um, so when you have very high quality milk like a Marciana goat's milk, if they are being taken care of the way that they are um, by these you know, expert shepherds and they're being fed this really amazing diet of um, all the, the things that I mentioned before, you do get that very clean, like very bright flavor. And we also have a comment, creamy and not very salty, as you pointed out. Mm -hmm. um, it is a bit nutty and I agree with that. It has that almond kind of flavor. And I was so glad you said that because I was trying to think of it and then mm -hmm. you said almond. It's very subtle. It's very subtle, yes. but it's there. Yeah. Yep. For sure. Um, so I also, before we move on to the next thing, um, I also would like you to cut a piece of cheese without the rind and uh, taste that separately. So I'm just going to cut a little piece here. It's so much more mild. It doesn't have those like very fruity flavors. Um, I just really wanted to point out how important eating the rind is to the experience of eating this cheese. So whenever I get rind related questions from customers, um, which honestly is pretty often, it's a very, uh, very common question that we get as cheesemongers. I always tell them what my mentor told me the first week that I was learning how to monger, um, which is the rind is always edible unless it's not, which is, Something that's, it seems kind of vague, but when you think about it, it's very correct because the rind is technically always edible unless it's made of something inedible like um, cheesecloth or bark or wax. So that doesn't mean that every rind is edible and delicious like the Morcia Alvino rind. Um, I wouldn't necessarily recommend eating every cheese rind, um, but uh, this one definitely, definitely adds to the experience of eating the cheese. So I always tell my customers it's a personal preference. It's up to them to decide what tastes good to them. Um, so overall, this is a really, really snackable, crowd-pleasing cheese. It's a little adventurous, but not intimidating at all. And in my experience, definitely universally loved by cheese novices and mongers alike. And that makes it perfect for catering platters, raising tables, serving at parties, just snacking at your home on a Friday night. So, all right, we, what do we, we think? Have a, have a few more comments. Okay. Um, I can taste the olives and almond. It takes me to Spain. Good, that's, <laughs> that's exactly great. the intention. Yes, and then awesome. another love the texture and mildness. And that then we have a, um, it almost tastes saltier without the rind. And I can see little, that for sure. Yeah, a little more savory without the rind. Uh, mm -hmm. Oh, and we have a pairing. Paired this cheese Ooh. with roasted walnuts and chocolate covered Seville oranges. Oh my. That sounds that great. Sounds Honestly, amazing. that sounds amazing. Yeah. 
All right. Um, so let's move on to cutting, wrapping, and merchandising. So we can go to the next slide, please. Oh, we have a good right. question here. I'm sorry, okay. Amelia, one second. Sure. Is cheeses branded with different names? Will they all taste the same? Um, yes, they should, um, because they are all the same Morcia Albino PDO cheese. It's just the different, um, the different producers or um, importers are branding them as uh, different like brand names, but they are all Morcia Albino and they're all made according to those very strict PDO guidelines. And by that very small group of producers. Yes. Right. Yep. Okay. Great. Um, so we already know, because we've just tried it, this is a very delicious, amazing cheese. So now, how do we sell it in our stores? I believe that we have a mix of like more experienced mongers and some newer mongers in the group. So um, some of you might be familiar with the terms that I'm going to use, but I'll go ahead and explain them for any of you who are not familiar. For a cut to order display or a full serve case, you definitely want to what we call glass wrap or crystal wrap that different people use different terms, um, but you definitely want to glass wrap this cheese. Um, that basically just means plastic wrapping so that you end up with a completely smooth face like glass, like you see in the photo there. Um, I, I did that and uh, took a photo of it at my counter. Um, and that means you're just basically pulling all of the excess plastic wrap to the back and underneath the cheese. So it's hidden from the customer's view, which basically means you want the customer to get a very clear view of that stunning burgundy rind. This is a very memorable cheese that has become very popular recently. Um, so people have actually been recognizing it, recognizing it in the case before I even point it out. Um, and if they don't immediately recognize it, that wine bathed rind um, is usually a great selling point because um, this is actually the only wine soaked European goat cheese. And you know, wine and cheese is a classic pairing. Who doesn't love those together? So even if they haven't tried it before, they are going to want to once they hear that. So if you're like me and you work in a higher, vol higher volume grocery store rather than a smaller specialty shop, you might cut and wrap pieces of Morcia Albino for your grab and go case rather than cut to order. So my staff is usually cutting two to three wheels per week because our customers are just really crazy about this cheese. Um, and during the height of the pandemic, we sold even more than that. So let's talk about the best way to cut and wrap for a retail case for cutting. I like to use a table wire for this cheese because it is pretty soft, um, but you can also definitely use any large knife that you have behind your counter. The way that I do it is I cut the wheel in half and then I cut pieces radially off of that half wheel. And I do have an example of the way that this looks on the slide there. Um, this is the method that in my experience yields the most even cuts and the least waste. Um, I have also seen mongers cut the wheel into quarters and then cut retail pieces from there. But for me, it's a little bit harder to cut uniform pieces off of that without taking the nose off. Um, and that produces waste. Although, you know, for cheese mongers, waste usually means snacks, which is not always a bad thing. Um, but if you do go this route and you take the nose off of your cheese, just be aware of your rind to paste ratio. Don't take the nose off too far back. Otherwise your customers are gonna get a piece with a lot of rind and not an even amount of paste. And then your cut pieces are gonna look uneven on display. So when wrapping your cut pieces, make sure that you are plastic wrapping them as tightly and neatly as possible. Um, this is for aesthetic reasons and also to lengthen the shelf life. And so make sure all of the plastic wrap is pulled to the back of the cheese and then secure it with the price tag or the scale label, um, whatever you need. I also like to use the repack labels that come with the cheese, whichever brand that you have. Um, because they do draw the customer's eye to that cheese. It's, they're always very cute labels. Um, and they also provide information that you might not have space for on your scale tape or your, your label or whatever you're using. Um, so they are, there are different brands of Murcia Albino, um, but they all do have that PDO seal on them that guarantees an authentic product. And this specifically is what we wanna teach our customers to be on the lookout for. One of our jobs as cheesemongers is to educate our consumers and then give them the tools that they need to confidently purchase authentic and high quality products like Morcia Albino. So in terms of the size of your cut pieces, that's really up to you. Um, you wanna base it off of your customer's buying patterns and also the price point of this cheese. And in my opinion, um, the popularity and snackability of this cheese coupled with its fairly reasonable price point makes it easier to actually sell larger pieces in a retail setting. We've had, um, at my counter, we've had success cutting them into pieces that are like roughly one third to uh, one half pound. 
but it's also a good idea to consider the optics of the price tag on the cheese itself, because unfortunately, a lot of customers are generally more likely to look at that price tag first before they consider how much cheese they actually need for what they're doing. So um, what I've been told by mentors is that a number between seven and 12 is usually like the sweet spot. It's not very scary to customers. So I generally try to keep it around there for cheeses in the grab and go. And in terms of how often to cut this cheese, I always recommend only cutting as much as you need on the shelf. And if it's busy, cut a little bit of back stock. Cutting the, your cheese as you need it ensures that your customers are always getting the product as fresh as possible. And it also helps preserve that really intense flavor. If you give your customers a really good experience and they enjoy this product and it's fresh and it's flavorful, they're gonna come back and they're gonna buy more cheese over and over and over again. And you've created repeat business. Every piece of cheese that you cut and sell is an opportunity for you to make a good impression on your customers and create repeat business, which is good for you, it's good for your shop, and it's good for the producers especially. So it's really important to remember that every time you go to work at your counter. Um, do we have any questions about that? No questions. Uh, oh, we do have one question about um, whether it's easier to digest for lactose intolerant folks because it's a goat's milk cheese. Yes. Yeah, it is. I have a lactose intolerant brother. And whenever he comes to visit, I make sure I have this cheese available because he loves it too. Great. Good for him. There's, there are a lot of, um, there are a lot of people out there who don't know that um, they, if they're lactose intolerant, that goat's milk is a little bit easier on the stomach. And also that aged cheese doesn't have lactose in it. Um, that is something I won't get into now, but that probably is like the most shocking revelation to everyone I talk to cheese about. <laughs> talk about cheese too, sorry. Right. Well, the person that asked, asked that question said, wonderful selling point, thank you. Yes, it is a good selling point. Because there are a lot of people out there who may not, have a severe lactose intolerance, but they still have a little bit of trouble with it. So the fact that there's a delicious goat's milk cheese that doesn't taste barnyardy yeah. and is so snackable is a really, really good option. It definitely is. All right, so um, if we could go to the next slide, please. Sampling, which is, um, I don't know if all of you guys are going back to sampling or if you already have because of COVID. Um, we did start sampling at my shop a while back and um, it's, it's the best thing that you can do for your sale to be perfectly honest. Um, everybody, every monger knows that the, the sample can make or break the sale. So if a customer doesn't already wanna buy a piece of Morcia Alvino based on your flavor description or um, anything that you've told them already, I would definitely offer them a sample if you haven't already. Um, one of my favorite things to do is offer a sample of any cheese that I have out to any customer that comes to the counter. Um, it kind of, it's a good way to start a conversation to open that conversation for people who may or may not be a little bit afraid to talk to a cheesemonger based on you know preconceived notions of us being very pretentious, which is not true at all. Um, so I would offer them a sample of Morcia Alvino and the important thing to remember when you cut samples of this cheese is make sure to include the rind, um, which I've already talked about in the, the previous portion, but the rind is completely edible as we've learned. Um, and it's also a really important part of the experience of eating this cheese. And so a lot of customers are intimidated by rinds of cheese and they don't know which ones are edible or not. We've already gone over that, but I do always try to reassure them that the rind on the Morsi Alvino is not only recommended, but it's also delicious. Um, and we've proven that with our tasting. So while we're talking about it, I wanna give you guys a couple of notes on sampling technique that I have kind of picked up over the years. So one, when you're cutting a sample, always, always, always face your cheese first, um, depending on how long your cheese has been plastic wrapped in your case whatever. Um, basically you wanna scrape or cut a thin layer of the face of the cheese um, before you cut a sample for that customer so that they're tasting the cheese itself and not any like residual plastic wrap or fridge flavor. Um, you just wanna give them the best flavor experience possible. And then also if they like the cheese and they want to buy a piece of it, you always cut from the side of the cheese that you sampled from. And this ensures that 
um, the customer gets the, a piece of cheese that has the same flavor as the sample that you've given them and they know what, what to expect from the cheese. Um, oh, the most important thing, I tell people all this, I tell people this all the time, every new monger, do not sample off the tip of a knife over the counter. Please never, never do that. I know it looks cool. It's really dangerous. <laughs> like you, one of the cardinal rules of handling knives at the counter is never point a knife at someone. So it's just kind of, it's a no brainer. Don't do that. Um, the easier way to do that is to have like little pieces of sample paper ready. I like I cut small pieces of like a Logan wrap or a deli paper or cheese paper and just have them in a little container off to the side on the counter, just ready to kind of take a piece, put a sample on it and put it right on the counter. I always put it right onto the counter so and then kind of step back so that the customer can take it themselves and then there's not, they're not touching my glove or anything like that. So to avoid that cross contamination. It's just a lot safer, it's more sanitary, so. All right, any questions as we go to the next slide and talk about the, um, the last couple of points in our class? I have a couple of comments for you. Cool. Facing the cheese is a great tip. Mm -hmm. And love that you were mentioning this. I'm assuming that means about sampling off the tip of a knife. <laughs> it's um, su surprisingly an, an overlooked thing. I've, I've done quite a few cheesemonger invitationals and I have seen so much of that. If you're competing in CMI this year, don't do that. Hot tip. Yeah. They will take yeah. points off. Yep. Um, so I do also want to talk about pairing. Um, someone mentioned pairing earlier um, with what was it, like chocolate covered oranges. And I really wish I had thought of that because that sounds <laughs> amazing. Um, but one of the common, most commonly asked questions at a cheese counter is what would you pair with this? Um, and, any form of that, um, which it kind of seems daunting if you're a new monger who is suddenly trying to learn 250 cheeses and what goes well with each of them. So if that is a little bit scary to you, um, I, I do have a few tips to make it a little bit easier. One of my best pairing suggestions is to remember the phrase, what grows together goes together. And this means that the cheese from a certain region or country will like most likely pair well with other products from that region or country. We're talking wine, beer, cider, charcuterie, nuts, jam spreads, anything, you name it. There are some exceptions, but generally it's a, it's a pretty safe assumption. When you think about pairings, you also wanna consider that your pairings should either contrast or complement the flavors of your cheese. You never want your flavors to be fighting against each other. You want them to just work in harmony in your mouth. Um, example of a contrasting pairing, a very popular one, is blue cheese and honey. The spiciness, saltiness of that blue cheese is contrasted and neutralized by a sweet pairing like honey or fruit spread. But an example of a complementary pairing would be something like Gouda and bourbon. All those things both have very similar sweet flavors. So you see what I'm talking about here? That said, Murcia Alvino is a cheese that is fairly mild and it does taste great with just about anything. I ate it with so many different things in preparation for this class. And so anything listed in here is um, just what I found to be my favorites of everything that I tried. So here are some of my suggested pairings. I did work in collaboration with our wine buyer and our beer buyer here at the Green Grape um, to create this pairing guide for you, both very talented people. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Michelle. So we already know that Morcia Alvino is soaked in wine made with Monastrol grapes. This is a local varietal. It has a lot of big plum, blackberry, black pepper, herbal notes. The fruity flavors in the wine really complement the sweet and creamy notes of the cheese and that creates perfect balance on the palate. So any light to like medium, maybe bodied Spanish red wine is good for this cheese. Um, I would recommend something like a Tempranillo or a Rioja um, and also because Morcia Alvino is on the milder side, you can't go wrong with a, a Spanish white wine either. So Albarino, Verdejo, um, she even suggested cava to throw some bubbles into the mix because there is like a good fat content in this cheese and those bubbles are just gonna cut right through. It's gonna be a really great ex flavor experience. These are very fresh herbal flavors and they're really, really refreshing with the fruitiness of the cheese. 
And so then I talked to our beer buyer and he suggested um, beers called, uh, Spanish beers called Macu or Estrella Galicia. And these are both lagers. So they are gonna be very light and very floral. So that's gonna be really nice um, with this cheese. And I also personally, I really like to go kind of funky Basque Cidra. Um, I'm very much a cider person. So that's always what I gravitate towards when I'm looking for cheese pairings. It, Cidra is, is slightly tart, some of them. So I really like that tartness of the cider and it plays well with that grapey flavor of the cheese. It's very cool. Um, for those of you who are adventurous, uh, I have a friend who is a mixologist and he suggested a fruit forward um, mezcal cocktail. And that sounded really cool. So the next time we hang out, I will be bringing some Morcia Alvino and we're gonna test that out. Uh, in terms of food pairings, um, for charcuterie, we can do a slightly spicy salami like a chorizo. I also really like very thinly sliced lomo or jamón serrano, um, just very classic Spanish charcuterie that pairs well together. For nuts and fruits, we have Marcona almonds. Um, they're classic, they're iconic, they go with everything, they're delicious. I also really liked caramelized walnuts or pecans. Um, with, we've got dried apricots, um, raisins on the vine, dried figs. The sweetness of these fruits are gonna pair really beautifully with that kind of tannic wine flavor of this cheese. And something that was surprising to me that was also very delicious was the date and walnut cake. There was just something very cool about that like sticky, crunchy flavor with the, the creamy texture of this cheese that was, just made it very exciting to eat together. Um, another fairly obvious pairing is grapes. I mean, don't overthink it. The People try, tend to overthink pairing so much. And if there's one thing that I want to like impress on you guys, it's that you should not stress out about pairings. Um, sometimes it's as simple as cheese is soaked in wine. Wine is made with grapes. Grapes taste really good with the cheese. It's a perfect pairing, honestly. So um, for just finishing up this list uh, for jam and honey, I really, really like orange blossom honey and um, fig jam. And I actually, um, I did the counterculture class um, on Monday about the Manchego alternatives and I got a Valencia orange jam in that box and that was really good with this cheese, I have to say. So um, any light and sweet fruit jam, very floral honey, that's going to be good. Um, and then for crackers, you need some sort of a crunch and to just complete your cheese plate. I love a savory cracker with a sweeter cheese, something with a like an herb of some kind. It's really going to highlight the complexity of that Murciana goat's milk. Um, it was suggested traditional Spanish picos or breadsticks or the um, Inez Rosales tortas were really good with it as well. So basically when it comes to pairing, like don't stress out at all. There's guidelines for pairings and there's some very successful pairings, but there's no hard rules. Um, it's all about what you like, what tastes good to you. Just enjoy, enjoy the ride. We've so got some, um, we've got some comments, Amelia, tell and me, tell um, me. a pairing. Uh, Lisa says, I put a piece on a rustic bakery's apricot pistachio and brandy artisan crisp was wonderful with berries too. That sounds um, awesome. Yeah, and Michelle says, great pairing suggestions. How about those beautiful dehydrated fruits? Yes. Um, Eduardo actually suggested to use a jam knife if the cheese has, is a little warm because it can be sticky, which I think is yes. an interesting suggestion as well. Yes, um, I actually was going to talk about this knife real fast um, because it is a soft cheese knife and it has these holes in there. So it, it is good for cheeses like this that are semi-soft but have um, like a creamy texture because it has those holes in there and the paste isn't gonna stick to it when you cut it. So if you don't have one of these, I would definitely recommend um, having one of these at your counter, at your home, whatever. Yep, sounds good. I know I love those knives, they're great. Um, somebody else said, do go to CMI, best time ever. I would agree with <laughs> yeah. that. Yeah, definitely. And, uh, we have another really nice comment, and, and I agree with this as well. I really appreciate all the specific basic handling and care info in this training. I would love to see more trainings incorporate these monger skills. Thanks. Oh, we'll thank have you. Amelia back again. Absolutely. Um, and I would love Eduardo, to be back. Eduardo says that knife is perfect, Amelia. So great. Awesome. Thanks. Anybody awesome. else have some pairing ideas or thoughts they'd like to share?
Let's mm -hmm. see. Oh, we did have a question. Um, oh, good. It's been answered. And if anybody else wants to know, I'll answer it live because it was answered by um, our, the, our person who's running the, the program behind the scenes. Um, these sessions are all recorded and you can always find them on our YouTube channel. Um, it usually takes a couple of days for us to edit the recording, um, but it's a great way to catch up if you've, if you've missed something or if you wanna you know, find out uh, something that you've forgotten, you can find all of our virtual countercultures there. I should also mention that we are going to be starting to do live countercultures again in September. So we're very, That's very awesome. excited about that. Yep. That's super exciting. Yeah. And somebody just, right. you got, just got a new follower on Instagram, Amelia. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Great. That's awesome. Love oh. that. And another nice thank you. Um, these are always wonderful. Thank you for keeping us in the loop on industry updates. And thank you all who made this event possible. Um, oh, yes. I'd love to bring a live tasting to Austin, Texas. That would be awesome. <laughs> so would I. I'll go to Austin any day. Me too. Um, they got good barbecue there. Yes. Oh, amazing barbecue. Amazing yeah. everything, really. Um, and if I'm just going to make a little bit of plug of a plug here for culture um, trade newsletter. If if some of you folks don't already subscribe, it's a great way to stay on top of what's happening, um, the, all the events we have going on. So you can go right into our website and subscribe. So, oh, someone's going to drive up from San Antonio to attend the live tasting. So we've got to plan it now. Um, Philly too. Okay, we've got all kinds of locations now. Got to start making a list. Yes, yes. For sure. Yeah. Just have a couple more minutes. I have one more thing that I want to touch on and then um, we can open it up to some questions. Yeah. Cool. Um, so if we want to go to the next slide, the last thing I want to talk about is how to serve Morcia Alvino. Um, so whether you're having a party at home, you're building a catering platter, you're doing a grazing table, whatever you're doing, this is a really, really perfect cheese for that. Um, so when you include it on a platter, um, the way that I do it is cut a piece that's about like a third or a half a pound, depending on how thick you want those pieces to be. And then you cut that piece into smaller triangles. Um, and I do have a photo of how I did that in the slide because I did use this on a catering platter recently. Um, and also, again, make sure you leave the rind on those pieces. Um, but it, it is a very important part of the flavor experience, like we've said so many times, but it's also really visually stunning on a platter. Um, people like gravitate towards that cheese. Um, and also I wanna say, don't cut your slices too thin because of that fudgy, creamy texture. You wanna cut them thick enough that when they bite into it, they really get to experience that texture. The total amount of cheese that you should be cutting for your platter or for your order or whatever is always dependent on a few factors. So the number of guests and then how much other food is going to be served at this event. Um, so I normally recommend to start with one ounce per person per cheese, and then you adjust that based on all of those factors. Obviously, if there's a lot of other food being served, I decrease the amount of cheese I'm, I'm serving in order to avoid food waste at the end. Another thing I wanted to talk about is always cut your cheeses for platters into pieces, smaller pieces that are easy to pick up and eat. It's really important to make your platters accessible for easy snacking so that your guests aren't intimidated by this like big chunk of cheese on a platter that they don't know how to cut into. And then they end up like not enjoying that spread because nobody wants to be the first person to destroy that beautiful platter. It's like a weird fear that happens all the time. So if you pre-cut all of your cheese and, and, and serve it in a very easy, to easy to grab way, people are gonna enjoy that platter faster and, and more really. Um, so you can, I take these triangles and then I arrange them on my platters um, kind of diagonally along the length of the platter, um, corner to corner, and then I fan them out in like alternating ways. It just like creates this very whimsical appearance and it also gives the, appear like, the appearance of abundance and like more cheese on that platter. Basically, you just want to create a platter that's very inviting um, rather than intimidating. So there are, I mean, the charcuterie board trend is is rampant right now. So there's a lot of um, there's a lot of different examples of that, and that's my favorite like creative part of being a monger is you get to just play around with that all the time. 
Um, but outside of that, this is a very versatile cheese. Um, it is perfect for like elevating a fresh seasonal salad. You can put it on a sandwich. It melts really well because it is so like dense and, and creamy. Um, I've seen some people make some really cool grilled cheeses with this. So definitely don't underestimate it for cooking. Um, but yeah, that is, uh, that's how to serve Morsi al vino. Um, I, I don't really have anything else to say, but um, that is, that's my presentation. Thank you guys so much for listening. Um, I hope it was really helpful to you and that you can use these tools from the presentation to promote this amazing cheese um, to your customers. And thank you also to Susan and Eduardo and Mercedes um, for having me and for presenting with me. It was a, a really, really fun time today. So I think we'll open it up to questions now. Yes. We've only got a very few more minutes. Thank you all for interacting so sure. nicely during the presentation. That's great, but we will take yeah. any last minute questions. We've got four minutes left on the clock here. Um, don't be shy. <laughs> I think there's one last slide that has an email address on it if you come up with any other questions after the class. Okay. We have, uh, Rachel says, thank you for the presentation. Got some new ideas for sharing and an already booked something, I missed it, but it'll come up again. Oh, there you go, great. With an already loved cheese. And outstanding, Amelia, it's hard to believe you've only been in the business for five years. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you so she, much. She's a pro. So. Awesome. Great. All righty. Well, thank you, everybody. And I want to give um, Eduardo and Mercedes an opportunity to say goodbye as well. So, um, but on behalf of culture, um, if we could get back to the, the, the speaker view. There we go. Um, so on behalf of Culture, I would like to say thank you uh, to everyone for taking the time to join us today. It's been a really interesting presentation, and um, I hope that you all agree. It's, you seem to. So um, really wonderful that we can get together and do this. And uh, even though we're going back to the in-person uh, countercultures, we will continue to do these virtually because we can gather so many people from all over the country together at once, which is great. So Eduardo. Okay, uh, thank you everybody. Um, it was an amazing presentation uh, from Emilia. I'm very happy. I enjoy the presentation um, very much. Uh, a lot of ideas um, how to, to use the, the cheese, how to, to preserve the cheese, how to to get the cheese, uh, uh, mm, very good. Thank you very much. Thank you, Eduardo. Mercedes, do you have a, a couple of last minute? No, I think well, we're all set. Um, thank you again, everyone. And we look forward to seeing you online or in person. Um, there'll be a culture cohort at the fancy food show. So if we haven't met you in person, we'd love to meet you there and uh, stay in touch. Thanks. Bye -bye. Thanks everyone. Have a great day. Thanks. Bye. Bye.